I'm going to talk about the project, uh, the last project, um, which is also pretty long. So based on the successes of the, of the typographic matchmaking, the first one, and working also, being encouraged to work uh, and experiment with working with letters outside of the printed world and more into material and into a physical space, um, we came up with this idea that maybe it's time to work on a, on a project that deals with lettering, public space, and architecture. So the teams were bigger, so there were three-person three teams. We had again five teams, and the, the three-person teams were Dutch-Arab, uh, two designers, graphic uh, type, and uh, architect, or product designer. And the idea was to look at, um, <clears throat> to actually be inspired from public space, to look at what, what happens with text in, 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 in our living environment. It's, we use text everywhere around us, so it's, it's uh, in the products we buy, it's in the clothes we wear, it's on the streets. It's... But what is interesting is that when it's on the streets, it's, always, it's often an indication. Like, this is where I exist, this is my shop, go left. You know, it's always instructional, it's never really, um, it never really engages the space. Most of the time it's just a skin over a building. You know, it's, it's almost um, like a sticker. It's, it's not really part of it. So we looked at a lot of things like um, uh, the way, for example, text was used in Arabic or old Islamic architecture. It was an element of ornament. It was really poetry. Sometimes it was. Uh, sometimes it, it also said, you know, this is the mosque was built by so and so, so it had information. But sometimes it was also just beautiful poetry or just nonsense. It's just visuals. It had no meaning. And then we looked also at things like um, in the turn of the century when architects were actually doing the lettering for the buildings and this belief that the building and whoever lived in it was, you know, whoever inhabited this building, whether it was a company or something, was kind of eternal. So the, the architecture and the writing were just part of the stone. They were part of the building. It's almost you have to cut them out. So that was very nice to, to look at and then say, well, maybe we need to think about that. You know, we do things always as designers in a very ephemeral way. We think we're going to be you know, put aside the next day. So what if we look at the poetry of typography in space? What does that mean? So it's a very open-ended question. So we did a few trips in Holland, in uh, Dubai. Um, at some point we had in Dubai, we could uh, use, um, we had a, a building, an old art garden, Old architecture um, as old as, as, as possible in Dubai. One of the older parts that was in the port, and they used it as cultural spaces. So we could have one space, we could use it to, to meet people, to have discussions about our project as it was going on, and to actually be in an architecture that's not made with this idea it's going to be, you know, changed tomorrow. So this is a bit of fun. Um, looking around and being kind of uh, tourists. Looking at how signages, so this was our workspace, our house. We could do an exhibition, we could open it up, people could come in and talk to us about what we were doing. It was really good to have a sort of you know, feedback as you're doing the research. <laughs> Look at the examples of, you know, lettering from the 1970s, um, these light boxes that were kind of bilingual and how, how people were trying to kind of link them with the same and things that are very calligraphic that are done in the old fashioned way of really engraving into the metal and then painting it by hand and then things like contemporary which were stickers basically stuck on the wall so it's a really good um, example of things then what happened is then each designer or each design group each team um, decided to take a direction so the first team um, their font was called Kufan because they worked on this Kufi and Amsterdam lettering, so it's a combination of two words. But they wanted to explore this idea of typography that is made for signage, but a signage that is not about directions, but a signage that is kind of mapping uh, the life of the city. So they, they wanted to work on this idea of emotions, um, the emotional aspects of, of text. I should have showed you more slides. 
this is um this is what they end up with in terms of the Arabic. Um, they they use the the old um, Kufi sign, which is one of the earliest writing, and then of course they modified it. And they looked at the same time at what could be possibly a good match for it in Latin, and then they worked from the Amsterdam style of Art Deco. And somehow the connection between those two things is plain. It actually comes from this idea of, cons of, of constructing your letters for heavy materials. So they cannot be, you know, they cannot be light, they cannot be, they cannot have fussy details. They should have a monumental, very impressive presence. Of course, it's a, it's a typeface that should, should work in different ways. So of course, they made the light version of it, which is alien to both original things. I mean, you don't make light version of, of Kufi. But they did, and it's kind of interesting to see, you know, the skeletal shape and this kind of relationship between these two scripts. So when you see them on the page, of course, they they work together, but they're very different <coughs> at the same time. And that is the beauty of, of this project. So they try to imagine, okay, now the next step was, and the project was to imagine how they could possibly be used, and they came up with this idea that. <coughs> They should be able to be read, to be read on a very small scale because that's how we read signage. Really, we read it on our iPhones, but we also read it in public space on the three-dimensional thing. And then to look at how we can interact with the physical environment, and if it was to be engraved. So, if we're going to use it for traditional things, what does it look like? <coughs> The second project was um, called Hamsa, which was really, um, it means whisper in Arabic, and it was very interesting. It was, I think the name of all these projects came in the very end, obviously. In this one, it was interesting because the whole process was about editing and editing and editing until almost nothing is left. <laughs> That's why they called it the whisper. Their starting point was actually starting with this um, with the physical building material. So they looked at, uh, because we did our research trips between Dubai and Amsterdam, they were looking at how people actually did the uh, city planning and how there was a lot of um, sort of graving, engraving, no, what is the word in English? Um, when, when, you, when you take the sand out and you let water in, and vice versa. So this playing with water and sand, of bringing the sea into the land, bringing the, you know, covering up part of the sea. And, um, and these are two techniques that are used in both cities, so they thought, okay, maybe this is, could be an interesting starting point. So we start with the actual physical aspect of, of, of building. So the whole project started with sand, and what they did is actually they started playing on, on the beach in sand, trying to make letters in the sand, um, carving them, pouring wax, trying to see how to make them stand up so they put them on sticks, they're still two-dimensional. Um, then they tried some experiments, you know, using that forms that they came up with, die cut them, what does it look like, how do you put it in space, how, you know, you can just have two letters on sticks. Um, then while they were doing that, of course, the negative thing became interesting, so they were thinking, ah, oh, maybe we could use the negative space to make graffiti or to make stencils or... But they still wanted to do three-dimensional thing, so then they extruded what they were playing with. So slowly, slowly, this project kept developing in all sorts of directions. So it became about, you know, using the same strip to create different parts of a letter, like strokes of a letter. But they became forms, so they could be completely sculptural. But their surface can be, again, something you can write on. Um, so they made experiments for real to see whether it actually works. So finally, they came up with this a form. The form is not so... Um, the form or the structure of the writing is not so unusual, but the way it developed was very nice process. And also, they became it became about stencil fonts that are not uh, what we assume stencil fonts often are. These very kind of rigid, uh, cut up pieces. It was really writing, and then cut up in, the, in a way that makes sense as, as the way you write in the different strokes, rather than in a very rigid, um, straightforward way. So they played with that idea. Um, then they developed, based on that, so they made variations of their typefaces, letters that are um, 
like the drawing of the letters, all the negative thing which could be the, the sense of form. And they even made one version, which is the dance steps version. And then some of the applications for that, of course, was, was uh, is endless, of course. So some of the ideas of, of that was to look at how you can actually engrave it in stone, or in this case, pour it or carve it out of concrete, or use it to make die cuts. So for example, if you were to, to have a covered souk, um, which is very common in the Arab world, what if the, the, the letters were what you cut out rather than, so what if you have shiny letters coming down from the sky, and you can still walk on them better. So they played with some of the experiments for that. The idea was again to, to, to make a, a system. What was very important about the project is to create ideas and systems that people can take and kind of rework in their own way. So we propose these ideas, but then somebody can take these drawings and these typefaces and actually develop something new from them. And this was really at the base of the project I'm going to show you. So this project is called Nukhat, and Nukhat means dots. And it's, um, they, they struggled with this idea of how do you make it, and the, the two systems work together. And they thought, okay, we cannot make, we, we don't want to merge them, we want them to kind of work like two plant farms uh, growing around each other, like a DNA. So they work together, they complement each other, they work in different ways, but they also, um, not the same thing. And they started with this uh, specific uh, style of, of Arabic calligraphy called uh, square kufi, which is really making, um, it's not only that you make square letters, but you also, when you write it, you build it as blocks like. So it's a really very decorative form. And of course, it's very suitable to work with in a, as an art piece or poetic thing. You don't want to write a whole text with that. And then they decided maybe that's too rigid. Maybe maybe it's good to go back and look at maybe um, other possibilities, like more calligraphic possibilities. Could it be possible to use the calligraphic possibilities to still create this idea of two scripts that are continuously dancing around each other, um, that can be written in one sentence, connected all the time, so they're all connected, whether you write Latin or Arabic, or you can mix the words in between. So they were looking at things, an example like this example, kind of uh, simplified tracing from um, a style of calligraphy. Um. It's okay, I can take it. Um, a style of calligraphy, I can't remember the name. Um, I can't even remember the name of the style, but it's basically a way of writing continuously. So there's no, there's no separation between the words. And they use that as a kind of way to develop their typeface. Um, still on this idea of the grid. And with, with the reason behind the grid was that they, you could um, either work with just dots or connect the dots or change the shape of the dots. And every time you play with that, um, you change the form of the letter. So for example, here you have an example of how it could possibly work. So you have it dots, but then if you connect them, it's a line, but then the line can have a different skin. And it can be also not that curvy in here, like the same on top, it can be more geometric. So their idea was that depending on the material you're going to use and the production techniques, you can actually play with it. So it's a, it's a grid, it's, it's like a, a skeleton for a potential typeface. Of course, they used mostly the dotted one. I think they liked it the most. And then they thought about this idea of how, how you would be able to use it so it can be on a screen like a LCD screen, LED, sorry. Um, so it can be used in something like inside the metro to give information. And since it's a, it's a multi-language, why not also include icons in it? So the idea is that you have a connecting line and you keep adding dots and it makes shapes, drawings, text. Um, but then if you connect them and you start to make three-dimensional objects, it can be um, a physical object, like uh, something that can be in a park that kids can play on and it says something, and maybe they learn a few words from playing on it. 
it can be something for signage, so it's just you know lights on the wall. It can be object in the space. So if you look from outer space, you can read it, but actually it's also public furniture. It can be really public furniture where you, <clears throat> in this example, they imagine that you have this bench and these, you know, this is an image, for example, from, uh, from Sharjah, where there's a lot of these empty uh, um, piazzas that are empty, completely empty, and, and it's in a sunny place, so nobody actually uses them because nobody's going to stand in the middle of a hot place and with no shading and so on. Um, so why not use something like this where you force people to actually sit and relax in a place like this? It's possible if it's shaded. And if the text then becomes poetry, then you start a conversation because it's in two languages. So this was one example. Um, or it can be on the staircase, so it becomes something that sticks out of the wall rather than being punched into it. So the possibilities are actually many. And they've only showed some examples. And, um, and it was interesting that at the same time that they were working on this, other people on the same group were working on something in a bit different. Another group was working on something similar but different. Um, in this group, they used um, this, the name Kashida comes from uh, a very simple um, element in Arabic calligraphy. That is, basically, it's a system of extending the letters so you can justify a text. So you can, instead of adding spaces, you add little strips of um, lines. And in metal, in metal type, they, they, were, they had a few of them, so they were really an object like this. Um, but in reality, um, it's just a, a, a line, the thickness of the baseline. Yeah. And so they wanted to use this idea of this strip as a connection. So what if you know, a, a font is made out of just one long strip, and if you bend it in different ways, you get letters. So this was the premise of this. So they started by experimenting with physical strips. So the first thing they did was bring a bag of tagliatelle break it on the and look at how actually material falls naturally. Um, so this was a, a starting point. And then they looked into this and they sorted it out and they discovered Arabic letters in there. So this was all began with the joke of you know, Arabic is just a big spaghetti. It's just like all these curves and curves and curves. So they played with that idea. And then to sketch, they actually made uh, strips of very thin aluminium and they really sat down and they started really bending them to get the form and to look at it as a sculpture because they're not making a typeface that is supposed to be printed, they're making things that are supposed to be objects. So why not sketch also as an object? Why not bend it and look at it and see where you can read it, what is the visibility, how does it stay interesting for you, no matter what direction you look at it. So they work together trying to see what are the, the gestures or the bendings that they could make that would work for Latin and for Arabic. Where are the things that are different? Of course, this is you know, at, the end, at the heart of writing, actually, because um, Latin is very, um, even the way you hold your pen, sometimes not correct, you have to be But you, know, you write with the steady hand. And with Arabic, you actually write like you're drawing. You just do this. And there's no one way. There's not one stroke that is at the same angle as another. <coughs> so the Latin had to become crazy, basically. And what you find in this experiment is because the Arabic is so free, the Latin was following it. What, what the result was was a crazy Latin typeface and a very perfectly normal Arabic one, which is very nice to see. And so this is the Latin. Um, and what they did in the process is actually make these sketches, scan them, make the drawing in 3D software on the computer, and then print it in uh, 3D printing. And then go back to the drawing and then change things again. <coughs> so working directly with the material was very important. So you see here this Arabic word is perfectly normal. Whereas the Latin, I, I think you can, you can have a not an easy time reading it, and it doesn't fit on any baseline, and it's completely insane. Um, whereas the Arabic is just, it's, 
normal that you have if you go up and down the, the, the baseline that you make it on the top, you go down. And that, this is perfectly normal, perfectly natural for, for the script. And that, that thing did not have that freedom. So it was very interesting to, in this experiment, to completely flip it. And you can say, well, it's got some charm, but you know, I don't know, maybe some people would think it's hideous. I think it's very funny. So this is the word design. You cannot sit on one line. Whereas the design in Arabic that you see here, it sits perfectly on one line. Of course, it has multiple base lines, but it's really linear. And the, 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 the English one doesn't. So this was a nice experiment. But then what you end up with in this typeface is, of course, you don't have a font in the traditional sense of software. Although it is only software, you can only have it if you produce it. You can only have it if you print it as a 3D object. And it's a little sculpture. It can be, you know, and their idea was eventually it can be. So it went away from being the public space to something you can actually probably the best solution for it is to wear it. Because if you make a building that looks like this, or a, I mean, a roller coaster that looks like this, it's probably like, it costs millions to produce. But conceptually, it's a very nice experience. 